Hello, everybody. <clears throat> I'm Bob Mary. I am uh, going to moderate this uh, discussion. I am the uh, political editor of the National Interest, formerly the editor and, and former C, uh, CEO of CQ. Um, our discussion topic has to do with the political context of American foreign policy, uh, and I'm going to translate that into two questions for our panelists. Um, what is the state of political sentiment with regard to American foreign policy today? And what kinds of barriers or opportunities does that pose for an alteration in policy directions from something approaching the neoconservative view, the Wilsonian view that is pretty much dominated from the end of the Cold War until relatively recently, um, and moving towards a more uh, realistic or realist or perhaps measured uh, approach. Um, now, I do have here a great panel, and I'm going to introduce them momentarily, but I have just a few observations. I used to be a political report, reporter before I got into uh, writing extensively about foreign policy. Um, and one of my observations during those years was that when it comes to foreign policy, the American people tend to delegate to their elected leaders and to the experts that are hired by their elected leaders to a far greater extent than they do on domestic policy, especially if it has to do with jobs. They're on it very, very quickly if things don't go well. Uh, but in foreign policy, they, it's more of a delegation with one significant proviso. Don't screw it up. <laughs> Because if you screw it up, we're going to pull it back. Uh, and a great example from the time of many of us, all of us have read about it, was Vietnam, in which uh, the problems of that uh, quagmire were such that the American people very dramatically pulled it back. I I'll say another example, which I think is World War I. We tend to forget, I think, uh, the history of that period in which uh, Woodrow Wilson not only took us into a war that didn't yield uh, the results that were advertised, but he also used the occasion for a lot of domestic policy making that uh, were very deleterious in terms of the economy and other things uh, and led to the 1920 election, which was truly one of the great political repudiations of our history. So those are examples of uh, the American people pulling it back. Um, now, it's possible that we are in a kind of a mild um, example of the American people pulling it back. It seems to be happening in terms of where the American people are right now. Um, and uh, it, it seems to me that uh, Syria, uh, in which Obama, Pre President Obama indicated he was going to move in that direction, and then he pulled back uh, because it seemed pretty clear that the American people weren't really um, favorable to that. Uh, might be exhibit A in that. But the question that rises right now, given what's happening in the Middle East in the immediate time frame, is what happens in that process if we find ourselves in a serious crisis? Um, and a crisis being potentially um, uh, Islamist fundamentalism uh, basically taking over large swaths of both Syria and Iraq and creating a kind of modern caliphate. Uh, and uh, where would be the American people, where will be the American people in that. In that context, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, our uh, panelists uh, for this discussion. Uh, John Judas, to my immediate right, is the senior editor of the New Republic and contributing editor of the American Prospect. He's written widely, as all of you know, in such publications as GQ, Foreign Affairs, New York Times Magazine, Washington Post. He's the author of, I think, six books. John, do I have Correct. that right? Um, including the current book that's out now and, and uh, has kicked up a certain amount of uh, uh, controversial dust, uh, Genesis, Truman, American Jews, and the Origins of the Arab-Israeli Conflict. And we'll start with John, but I'm going to introduce the other two. Uh, next, we'll have Chris Preble, Vice President for Defense and Foreign Policy Studies at the Cato Institute. Uh, he's written widely, uh, including, you might have noticed, he had a byline in the uh, op-ed uh, page of the New York Times just yesterday, author of three books, including The Power Problem, 2009, uh, Exiting Iraq, 2004, and, and my, my favorite, I think, is a very, very interesting study, John F. Kennedy and the Missile Gap, also in 2004. And finally, we've got Michael Cohen, who's a fellow at the Century Foundation, 
He's been a columnist uh, for The Guardian and uh, a week, wrote a weekly column for Foreign Policy. He's been a blogger for The New York Daily News. He's the author of Live from the Campaign Trail, which is about notable 20th century campaign speeches of consequence. And he's also published widely in such publications as The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, LA Times, Politico, uh, et cetera. So, John, over to you, sir. Good. I'm supposed to speak here? Is that right here? And you can all hear me? Um, I, I thought the subject of this uh, panel and of this conference has something to do with realism. So I'm going to sort of play off that uh, theme. And uh, I'll get around to politics at the very end. Uh, there's a narrow version of realism. I'm not talking about the a academic theory of realism or the diplomatic theory that, that uh, resonates with public opinion. And that, that, that's the idea that uh, uh, America should only deal with threats that uh, directly concern us. 9-11, people blowing up uh, our embassies, uh, trade battles that uh, concern our industries but that in places like Syria, the Middle East, Iran, or Ukraine, um, we should keep hands off. I, I, I want to begin by saying why I think that that view, which I think is prevalent and uh, is reflected in a recent Wall Street Journal uh, NBC poll about the opinion about foreign policy, why that's not a good approach for the country to take. And, and uh, then I'll come back to it at the end. Uh, two uh, obvious reasons. One, one is the uh, interdependence of the world. I mean, why should we care if Iran has a nuclear weapon? Now, you know, you could say that th there's different ways of dealing with it. We could say, well, it's good because then it'll balance the Israelis and there will be less chance of war in the Middle East. Or you could say, as the Obama people say, that it's very bad and it could start an arms race. But even though it's very, very unlikely that the Iranians would launch a nuclear weapon at uh, New York, uh, it's still of vital interest to us because a nuclear war could most likely, I would say, begin in the, in the Middle East. That's I, if I had to choose a place in the world. Uh, oil, uh, the world economy. So there's lots of reasons. And I, I think you could make similar arguments for a lot of the conflicts that we've engaged in that don't, on the surface, seem to directly threaten us. Uh, second reason is more controversial. There's a guy named uh, Kindleberger, a, a, f a famous economic historian who had a theory about the world economy that the world economy uh, works best when there's uh, one big, big dog on top of it and uh, when the uh, c currency itself is, uh, reflects the currency of that country. And, uh, you know, if you look at the history of uh, the world economy, uh, that, that theory works pretty well. I would make a similar kind of argument about geopolitics, about the wor world uh, sy system. And uh, may maybe I'd allow here for a bipolar as well as a unipolar world. But, but again, looking at the example of Britain in the 19th century, the United States and Soviet Union after 1945, I think there's a certain advantage to the world if there is a country, a big dog, that exercises leadership in the world. Now, the question is how? And that's uh, where we get to the questions about foreign policy. And uh, there, there's two kinds of obvious choices that, that are under debate. Uh, one I would associate with uh, neoconservatives, uh, liberal interventionists, uh, people who think in some respect that the, mo the, mo the way in which we can make ourselves most secure and the world most peaceful is to, in effect, create the world in our image, to spread democracy, to build uh, to help build nations that are, have institutions uh, roughly similar to our own or those of Western Europe. Uh, I think that there are a lot of reasons now to question that um, approach. And I wrote a book called Folly of Empire that was about that because, you know, one of the first examples is Woodrow Wilson in uh, Mexico. But we have a lot of them since. And uh, you know, most recently, we have Iraq. Or even mo more and more recently is the example of Libya. 
where if you look at the news reports now, uh, that intervention may turn out to have been a disaster and a mistake and uh, to have left the country and uh, the region in worse shape than it was before. So I think that there are many reasons uh, to question the neoconservative liberal interventionist approach. What, the alternative is something like balancing, something like the, the uh, strategy that the British uh, employed in the 19th century. And uh, I, I think that in general, that is a wiser strategy, even though it gets us in trouble to the extent that we end up having to uh, support, in some instances, very bad people and bad regimes. And to have reasoned, for instance, in 2003 that we were better off in the Middle East with Saddam than without him, uh, a position that would have been very hard to sell in the United States. Now, finally, let me go to, to the question of, of, of politics. Uh, foreign policy making is, uh, as, as Bob said, it's detached for the most part from the public. It only intersects at certain points. And uh, that's partly because it's complicated, partly because it deals with long range, and partly because in the United States we're an island nation, uh, in turn, a nation most of which is internal, uh, fresh water, uh, doesn't look outward, uh, does it, has a kind of view of foreign policy similar to the one that I, I sketched out at the beginning. Uh, and so foreign policy proceeds under those, the, these two levels, an elite level and a mass level. For the most part, I think that that's okay. It, where it's not okay is when, it become, when we get into questions of war and peace and uh, armed intervention. And in those cases, the public has to be brought in. And when it's brought in, it's often done in a most uh, deceitful or dishonest way. And I'm thinking of George W. Bush uh, and the, the Iraq War. So w what I'd say again is that we're in a situation now where uh, we're going to have to do things in the world that the American public might not ex accept, but that in doing them, we should pursue an option that is much less likely to involve us in armed intervention than the option of the neoconservatives and the liberal hawk. So that's my uh, pitch for today. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, John. Uh, Chris. Thank you, Bob. Um, and thanks to all of you for coming and to the organizers for putting on this event. Um, I, I think you. picking up on, on some of what John said, I think it's it's typical or the norm in foreign policy is for the public to have a, a relative indifference to what is going on in foreign affairs, relatively speaking, and certainly relative to their attention to domestic policy issues. And this isn't all that strange because after all, and has been emphasized a couple times today already, uh, the United States is extraordinarily secure by uh, relative to other countries around the world. And so uh, unlike in the past when people's foreign, uh, other countries, when they had foreign policy disasters, the country ceased to exist. Or, you know, you think back to the Peloponnesian War and, the, you know, the men were all put to the sword and killed and the women and children were all sold into slavery. You know, obviously, that's not the sort of thing we worry about here in the United States. So I think the public's relative indifference to foreign policy can be explained by that to a large extent. But I think what we've started to see over the last few years is, is not indifference, but actual outward uh, hostility and opposition to armed intervention. And again, there's a difference between kind of conflating or boiling down foreign policy to armed intervention. But I also agree with John that on, on the issues of war and peace, the, United, the, the public absolutely has to be engaged. That was not the case. One of, my, uh, one of the books that I used as kind of a jumping off point for my own book, The Power Problem, Michael Mandelbaum said back in 2005 that the American role in the world depends, may depend in part on Americans not scrutinizing it too closely. I think that was a fair statement. I think it was an honest statement. Um, but I just want to focus briefly on what we saw in late August and early September of last year. Um, we had an incident in Syria. Obviously, the Syrian civil war had been going on for some time. We had an incident in Syria involving the use of chemical weapons. President Obama had earlier said that the use of chemical weapons would, be a, would constitute a red line. What crossing that red line would result in, he didn't stipulate. Um, and uh, at the time, in late August, I think there was a widespread expectation in this city that he would follow through on that, that 
pledge by some sort of military action. That was the, all the reporting suggested that's where the Obama administration was leading. And what did we actually see? Um, uh, it was, I have to admit, I was a little embarrassed that I was caught off guard by this because, of course, it's my job to study foreign policy and particularly interested in the politics of foreign policy. And I could never have predicted the level of public opposition, bipartisan, that rose up to stop what in Secretary Kerry's own words, and I'm going to get this wrong, but this was a unbelievably small or incredibly small, it was a smaller than small military intervention. Okay, I didn't get the adverb exactly right, but smaller than small. And yet, even a smaller than small intervention mobilized the public in a way that I haven't seen in studying 11 years here in Washington and studying foreign policy, frankly, going back a couple decades now. Um, these sorts of instances are rare. And the question is whether or not that will be a one-off sort of thing or whether there is a more enduring public resistance, even hostility to military intervention that will influence uh, U.S. foreign policy going forward. I, I think so. Uh, it's not, not entirely new. A couple months ago, I reviewed uh, Bob Gates's book for the American Conservative, as a matter of fact. And Gates refers in the book several times to uh, the, the constraint that, uh, kind of loosely to the constraint that public opposition to the war in Iraq and Afghanistan imposed on him in terms of how he talked about those wars, how he talked about resourcing those wars. It was always about assuring the public that we weren't going to stay, that we weren't in there forever, that we were, you know, that we, that we were planning for the exit sort of thing, which, if you know anything about counterinsurgency strategy, really cuts against the strategy because if you're trying to convince the, your, your, the people you're protecting in those countries, uh, they want to believe that you're sticking around, and yet he had to worry about the public back here at home who was worried about us staying too long. So that is a constraint. Um, now, the, the neoconservatives and the liberal hawks both have an answer to this problem. And whether you look at it as a problem or not, it's a fact. The public is, is strongly opposed to military intervention, even the smaller than small ones. Now, the, the, the simple response is that this can be solved by leadership. You hear this all the time. Leadership, strong leadership. If only the president or if only the national security team were committed to a particular mission, they could bring the public along, that they could turn things around. It's, and so if the public isn't enthusiastic about it, it's solely a function of a lack of, of, of leadership, will, et cetera, uh, political courage, pick your term, on the part of the president and his advisors. I, I think there's very little evidence of that. I think there's very little evidence of that today uh, in, in 2014. Uh, but let's be honest, I think there's not a lot of evidence of that in American history. I mean, if we remember back to what Franklin Delano Roosevelt was trying to do to get the American people to support a war that, in retrospect, I think was a war worth fighting, and his efforts failed. Failed quite spectacularly. I, I, I recommend a very fine article by John Schusler on this, uh, on this subject several years ago in International Security called The, the Deception Dividend. Okay? So this is not a new phenomenon. When the public is strongly opposed to intervening militarily, there is very little that the politicians can do to turn it around, I think. Um, but you can rest assured that people will continue to invoke that because they could never prove the alternative. If the public will doesn't turn around, they can simply say, well, the leaders didn't try hard enough or they didn't care hard enough, and you can't prove the counterfactual, you can't prove what didn't happen. Uh, so we're just going to continue to debate whether or not the public will is a constraint or not. Uh, I, I tend to think that it is, and I think it's a stronger constraint than it was um, five or eight or ten years ago. One last point. Um, there is one other constraint. It's related to public will, and that's the willingness on the part of the public to spend lots of money to support an ambitious foreign policy, one that is not dedicated solely or even primarily to defending the United States and our vital national security interests, but that is also postured to defend the interests and security of a lot of other countries around the world. And that's, that is our posture. That has been our posture for a long time. That's also what Mandelbaum was talking about, about having the American people not scrutinizing the role too closely. Uh, contrary to what you might have heard, I have a visual aid here. Um, 
uh, two new infographics that Cato has produced, they're out there in the lobby, uh, that show that contrary to what you've heard, uh, the U.S. military spending has not been gutted. The U.S. military is not on the verge of obsolescence. We are not at risk of being swamped over by our, by our adversaries. What you do see, however, is a consistent lack of will, and not surprisingly on the part of our allies, to spend very much on defense. Why would you? If I were in their position, I'd do the same thing, right? You're not inclined to pay for things that other people will pay for you. Uh, but it's also true that in real dollar terms, we are spending more today than we did on average during the Cold War. More today than during the Cold War. Um, and that, but there is increasing pressure on the defense budget, on the military spending, both within the Pentagon's budget, with the rising cost of personnel mainly, paying, paying benefits, rising and crowding out uh, expenditures on equipment and on operations and maintenance. So that's happening. That is, a, that is, that is very hard to stop. Okay? So that will be a constraint increasingly. Um, and, and I think unless you believe that the American people are strongly inclined to cut spending elsewhere very deeply to fund a larger military budget, then I think that constraint will continue. So what we are left with is we will choose, because we can't do everything and we can't do everywhere, we can either choose well or we can choose poorly. And I worry that if we wait too long in kind of figuring out what it is and we don't choose a grand strategy like Barry Posen's restraint or offshore balancing or something like it, if we don't make a conscious decision to adapt our foreign policy to these real constraints, then we will choose poorly. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And uh, Michael. Um, so first of all, I want to thank um, GW and American Prospect and American Conserving, very conservative for putting this event together. It's really been a great, um, great day of conversation. So I want to pick up a little bit on what Chris was saying. And, and, and I think, first of all, the focus on Syria as an as a interesting um, div- inflection point in American support uh, for military intervention is actually a really interesting one. I think not enough people have talked about it. Um, it it's such a rare occurrence that it, that it occurred, and I think it has a, has a huge impact, at least in this conversation about uh, the future of American foreign policy. Um, but I want to sort of broaden a little bit of what Chris was saying, talk about not just American support or lack of support for military intervention, but Americans' interest in foreign policy, um, which if you look at the polls, it is, is at historically low levels. It's not just opposition to the use of force. Um, there's a broader sense that America is spending too much of its resources, too much time and energy overseas. And I, and I was looking at this, some of the poll numbers uh, before I, I came here today, and I was struck by this, the, the Pew poll from the fall of last year, which shows that, that more than half of Americans, this was, a, again, fall of 2013, agree the U.S. should mind its own business internationally and let other countries get along the best they can. That was a 52%, which is the highest we've seen since 1964. Um, in addition, 80% agree with the statement that we should think not so much in national terms, but concentrate more on our own national problems and building up our strength and prosperity um, here at home. And now, 80%, in, in this country today, when 80% of Americans agree on anything, it is a, it is a, it is a notable uh, occurrence, okay, um, considering the levels of political polarization we have. So, what you're seeing, I think, here is, is a broad base. And this, by the way, isn't just Democrats or Republicans or one party saying this. These are views that are, are widely shared across the political spectrum. Um, it's not, it, there's not a huge partisan gap here. Um, so I think you know, the indication I think you should draw from this is that people are, are a little tired of foreign policy, a little in there. They want America to focus on, on issues at home. And I, I think it's interesting, by the way, that 80% number I quoted for you, the last time it was that high was the early 1990s. Okay. The, the obvious parallel is that this is the end of the Cold War. People want to, to come home, and we have the end of the Iraq-Afghanistan War. People want to come home. I think that's a huge part of it. And the other part of it is the early 1990s were um, a pretty bad economy in this country, uh, akin to what we've seen over the past several years. Not, not as bad as the last several years, but certainly um, on a par. And I think that's also driving that. And I'll talk more about that uh, in a second. But if you look at broadly at public opinion on this, not just the, the Pew poll, but a lot of the different polls that have come out in the past couple of uh, months. There is this general sense that the U.S. is less respected around the world, less powerful, um, that we should focus on problems at home, we should work with allies, um, we should share burdens and national problems. I mean, this isn't a, a, a new, a new uh, view. People have long thought that we should share uh, 
uh, global burdens. It just seems to be at a much higher level than in the past. Um, what I think is the most interesting, though, about some of these numbers is the divide that you see between the public um, and, and the elites. Um, so, for example, uh, half of the public, 51%, says the U.S. Uh, does too much in terms of solving world problems, and 17% says that we do too little. Um, if you ask elites, and these are CFR, Council on Foreign Relations members, um, uh, 41% say we do too little, 21% say we do too much. Um, that's a huge divide uh, between elites and, and the public. Um, and if you look at sort of public priorities, where people think our foreign policy should be directed, the divide is even larger. And this was sort of fascinating to me. I, the number one concern among Americans and also generally among elites um, is terrorism. So there's broad consensus among both groups that we should focus on preventing another terrorist attack. Uh, for the public, the number two concern, what they want American foreign policy to focus on, is protecting American jobs. 81% say this, is, this should be a priority of American foreign policy. Among elites, it's 29%. Um, that, that is a huge divide. It's the largest divide, by the way, in, in this poll. The only one that's come close is climate change, which elites think is more important uh, an issue than, than ordinary Americans. Um, and, and sort of the odd element, I think, of this is that if you look at American foreign policy, particularly in the past 12 years or so, um, there's very little focus in our foreign policy on, on jobs and the economy, right? Uh, I, you know, this, um, I remember, reminded of in the, in the first Gulf War, the chant was no blood for oil. And you heard a little bit of this in 2000, 2003 in the Iraq War. And, I, and I, I think of that now and I say, you know, and I don't mean to be overly flippant, but I wish, I wish that we actually thought that this was about oil. Because then you could actually somehow justify you know, all the blood and treasure we've expended. But it's not. You know, we haven't fought uh, the, these wars for the last 12 years for economic reasons. Um, and, in, and in fact, I would argue that, in fact, the wars have undermined our economy dramatically. Um, there isn't a real connection between our foreign policy agenda and uh, the economy, and which is what you traditionally would think your foreign policy should be focused on, at least somewhat, uh, aside from security. Um, and I think that is something that Americans are, are responding to. So you know, if you think about sort of why we've gotten to this point, why Americans are so fed up, I mean, I think part of it is what Chris was talking about, about military interventions, um, certainly hangover from Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and I'm, I'm actually struck by, I was reading, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the, the recent uh, cover story in the New Republic by Robert Kagan about why America must continue to be a, a forceful you know, a, a leader around the world. Um, and of course, he warns against isolationism. The irony of this, of course, is that the, the individuals that are most responsible in some ways for this isolationism are people like Robert Kagan, right? I mean, they actually, the ones who are out there recommending we fight stupid wars, uh, who are out there saying we should get involved in Iraq again today, they are um, uh, promoting, in a sense, this sort of isolationist uh, bent among Americans. If you look at the polling today, I, this was, just came out about an hour or so ago. I saw a recent poll, uh, a poll on this from the, uh, on Iraq. Uh, 74% of Americans oppose intervention in Iraq, 16% support. I'm so actually surprised they found 16%, but, but <laughs> maybe they're all related to John McCain. I, I don't know, but it was, it was surprising. Um, but if you look at those numbers, right, I mean, imagine what would happen if the, if the U.S. were to get involved in, in Iraq. I mean, I, there would be a significant backlash, I think. There's, there's no question about it. You've seen this already, by the way, on the left with, with uh, groups like Move On and other folks who have already sort of warning uh, President Obama not to intervene or there's going to be a backlash and it's going to be affected in the midterm elections. Um, and of course, you've also seen, and I'm going to talk more about this in a second, but Hillary Clinton, you know, Hillary Clinton, who has really never found a war she didn't want to support. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I can't think of anyone actually in the recent last 12 years she hasn't supported. She is saying we shouldn't get involved in Iraq. I mean, that's actually kind of a big deal that I don't think enough people are talking about. Um, I think the second element of this, it's not, besides the hangover from Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, is that Americans think we should focus on problems at home. And if you look around this country today, right, if you look at the rampant inequality, if you look at our, our really underperforming economy, poor job growth, poor wage growth, our crumbling infrastructure, uh, the levels of political polarization are utterly dysfunctional uh, federal government. Um, you know, to, to put it candidly, I mean, as the, as the kids would say, America today is a bit of a hot mess. We've got all kinds of economic and, and at health-related problems in this country that need to be addressed, and they're not being addressed. And so I think for Americans, they would rather address these issues than further immerse ourselves in global conflicts. Um, now, having said all of that, 
All the poll numbers also indicate that Americans still want the U.S. to be globally, globally engaged. They want us to be a superpower. Um, this is a bit of how Americans tend to think on foreign policy. They want to have their cake and they want to eat it too. This has consistently been a, a feature in American foreign policy. We want to be a superpower, but we don't really want to do all those things that, involve, uh, that Robert Kagan wants us to do to be a superpower. Um, but I, I think the support, though, for that global role is fragile. And I think that you know, the, it's going to be undercut by more of a kind of military folly that we've gotten in trouble with over the past 12 or 13 years. And I think that's, a, that's sort of the message that should be taken away from all of this, that if you believe that the U.S. has a global role to play, if you believe that the U.S. needs to be um, involved around the world, okay, fine. But you also have to recognize that there are limits to that and that, the, the, that some of the things that you, that you want to do to enhance American leadership are going to blow back against you and harm the things that actually are important elements of American foreign policy. And I was, this was, I was talking this earlier, I was talking to, it's a very posing to this in the, in the thing, and I said, you know, people like Kagan are hurting their own argument uh, by sort of recommending the use of military force, and he pointed out quite, quite wisely that, in fact, they don't care about those issues, they care about going to war. That's really their main concern when it comes to American foreign policy. But for the rest of us who actually do care about America having a, a um, you know, being, having an important global role in you know, dealing with Iran's nuclear program or, or pushing for you know, uh, trade talks in the Far East. You know, these kinds of uh, uh, adventures are going to hurt that, that, that argument, and they're going to hurt that sort of liberal nationalism that progressives, for example, have long, have long supported. And again, I go back to the, to the Hillary example I mentioned earlier. I mean, I think that there is a sense maybe that this idea is sort of penetrating a little bit. Um, I, I mentioned it earlier, but I think the fact that Hillary Clinton, again, who is somebody who has consistently worried about sort of not appearing to be too dovish on, on foreign policy. She supported the Iraq War. She supported the surge. Uh, behind, the, behind the closed door, she supported Syria. She supported Libya. Um, she has been a f regular supporter of American Convention. And I think she's sort of of a, of a certain mindset in the Democratic Party that says that we can't ever afford to look weak on foreign policy. I, mean, I think that's kind of where she approached, how she approached this issue. Um, that she is now saying, no, wait a minute, let's step back, is indication to me that at least some of the political leadership is getting that. I think President Obama gets that. I think he understands it better than probably 99% of the people in this town. Um, that, you know, if you end up, if you continue to push foreign policy that Americans don't like, that Americans don't support, that they don't want to see as a do, then you're going to lose that critical support um, for the things that are important. Um, and I think, you know, if, for example, we move forward with, with, on something with Iraq, if we use force against Iraq, it's only going to give energy, um, not just to the opponents, you know, in the Democratic Party of, of force, the use of force, but also in the Republican Party as well. Um, I think someone like Rand Paul, if I was Rand Paul political advisors, I would be, this sounds crass, but you understand what I'm saying, I would almost be cheering for us to do something, because it would, it would give real energy to his critique of American foreign policy. Um, and on that note, I'll, 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 uh, I'll end and we can go to Q&A. Do you think that, that Rand Paul and his people are that crass? I probably shouldn't say, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> he is a politician, so it's certainly possible. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, if you have any questions, we would be more than happy to take them, and we would ask you to step to that microphone. Um, I have a question to sort of start off, and it's a plenary question for everyone. We can go down the line here. Um, so let's just say that the public opinion, which it c clearly has um, brought about a shift uh, in the last uh, year and a half or so, uh, it, it operates as much of a constraint as, as you and Chris were suggesting, uh, Michael. Um, but bear in mind at the same time that the elites have not really come around. They may be coming around because they've got their arm twisted behind their back, but not in terms of their own thinking. And we're certainly not seeing anything in Congress uh, that is attempting to put constraints on the administration. I mean, nothing like Gerald Nye's Neutrality Act of, what, 1935, which was a very powerful thing. I think Franklin Roosevelt actually violated it on the destroyer deal. It probably was, a, was an impeachable offense if anybody wanted to pursue it. Um, and it was a major constraint. We're not seeing anything like that. So what kind of a synthesis from this thesis antithesis might we see, or should we see, in terms of a foreign policy that reflects what Michael was saying, 
uh, for the uh, public opinion attitude that, yes, we need to be a country in the world. We need to be a country that is projecting itself diplomatically, backed up by, by power. But we don't want to go off and do these foolish things. What does that say? And I'll just, as a, just a little fill up here, you mentioned balancing. And balance of power seems to have been in disrepute in the last 20 years since the end of the Cold War. What role might that possibly play? Uh, let's start with, uh, with um, Mr. Judas here. Um, the, there's a lot of questions buried in there. I don't know which. Uh, pick, your, pick, pick, pick whatever you want. Yeah. Um, let's, uh, let me talk a little about, um, well, here, let me say this about the, the choices you gave. Uh, how does, how does the administration proceed when there's such a public antipathy to intervention? Uh, drones, CIA, all that stuff. I mean, that's where, mm -hmm. that's where it's led, uh, for Obama. I mean, that's, that's the, that's the alternative if you want to be active in the world, and there's obviously problems with that. I, I want to go back to the Syria thing because I have, um, see, the, being, uh, being uh, a, a leader in the world also involves credibility. I know this is a bad word because uh, Henry Kissinger always used to use it as an excuse for doing any, you know, for not leaving whatever conflict we were involved in. Um, Part of the problem that Obama got into in uh, both with Syria and now with Iran is this idea about red lines, where he said we're establishing red lines. And, and there, there was an odd political valence to that that uh, we should consider because, uh, um, you know, on the one hand, the public is, is not for any kind of intervention, but the, on the other hand, there is support for, you know, knocking off the evil guys. And uh, uh, part of, I, I believe that part of the reason that Obama got involved with the Syria red line was in response to Romney and McCain attacking him in the summer of um, 2012 during the campaign. And then in August, he says there's this red line. And then when it happens, when the Syrians do it, he does nothing. And I thought that was a very damaging thing. So the politics are funny. I'm just, I, I guess that's my comment. It's on the one hand, don't intervene. But there is a kind of inclination where there is, where there is a real bad guy to support our doing something. And uh, we get into trouble that way. And I think that Obama has gotten into trouble that way. Well, I think there is an inclination, but it's mainly here in Washington. Uh, to do those sorts of things. And the, and the lesson, if you're concerned about credibility, John, is don't, don't issue warnings or red lines that you don't have uh, the, the backing of the public to, to, to back you up. Now, my, in, in, his, in his defense, maybe he didn't realize just how much the public has had strayed away. But, I mean, Michael cited the scientific statistics on the gap between elites and, and the public. And, again, this is not a new phenomenon. This has existed for a long time. I did a very unscientific survey uh, in the, in the, this was in late August, early September, of the, the, the five uh, Sunday morning shows and counted 18 people in favor of intervention, three opposed, 18 to three, Chris, all Washington Chris, insiders. In what context? What, what? On the Syria intervention. Now. Like, no, this was, this was a year ago. So okay. a year ago when, well, when we were debating Syria, and, and, and it was a reminder, a very kind of vivid reminder of just how disconnected the political elites are in this town from the rest of the country that pays the bills. Okay? And again, in, in the past, that sort of public opposition didn't manifest itself. What was different last year was that for whatever reason, it was a combination of reasons, no doubt, the public did rise up and, and stop what I think I think, I think. I think Obama would have gone forward. He would have had sufficient support in Congress had the public not risen up in the way it did to enforce that red line in a incredibly, unbelievably smaller than small way. But he would have, and he would have checked off your box, John, that I keep my promises because I launched a military strike that checked that credibility box. I think he would have done that had the public not risen up the way it did. So just two quick things here. First of all, on the red line issue, I agree that politics plays a role here. This is a bit of a diversion from the main argument, but it seems to me that the one thing that Barack Obama is passionate about in foreign policy is nonproliferation, and uh, it does seem to be the one place where what? the one well, place he's passionate about is nonproliferation. Non 
Uh-huh. And I think that's both, you uh-huh. see this on Iran, I think you can sort of see it somewhat on the chemical weapons issue as well. I think that may also explain why he took the position he took. But to the point about Congress, this is, I think, the public was against the intervention in Syria, but it was Congress's opposition that I think ended up pushing the administration away from, from use of force. Um, if you remember that, you know, there was Republicans who generally are you know, supportive of use of force, but have become sort of mindlessly partisan in the past couple of years, were opposed to, to, to Syria. But Democrats were even more opposed to it, mm-hmm. or, or just as opposed as to it, I should say. Opposed, right. and, and that, I think, more than anything else, is what convinced Obama to, to not use force. And, and you know, for the record, I think he deserves enormous credit for that, actually. Uh, he made a series of one mistake after another in calling for red lines and not having a clear sense of what, he, what, he, what that meant or what he was going to do about it, and then getting caught basically behind public opinion when, he, when Syria actually did use chemical weapons. But I, I have a hard time thinking of any other recent example or any other historical example. I mean, seriously, you can name one, I'd be, be great, of a president basically saying, I'm going to use force to, you know, to, to maintain my credibility, both politically, domestically and internationally, and then saying, you know what, I'm not going to do this because I don't, I don't have support for it. That's unprecedented. Um, and it's a reflection, I think, of, you know, A, how badly they misread public opinion, but also frankly, how savvy a politician he is to realize that this was a disastrous decision to go for it. And he deserves a lot of credit for it. Um, and I think maybe part of what's driving this in some instances, I think politicians are sort of waking up to where Americans are on this. I mean, in a sense, voting for use of force against Assad over chemical weapons is kind of, would seem like a political slam dunk to a large extent, right? Okay, fine, I vote for it. Use some airstrikes. It's a, it's a pinprick, right? It's smaller right. than it's smaller. It's smaller than small. It's, it's not really a huge political problem. Not like, not like you know, calling for, for use of force against Iraq, for example. Um, and yet you had, I mean, br- I mean broad majorities in, in Congress who were opposed to this. I mean, I think that tells you a little bit about you know, where the conversation is shifting and that some you know, politicians are sort of catching up to this reality. Not all, but some. I see no one has stepped to the no, microphone. There's somebody so. right there. Oh, yes, absolutely. He's heading to Hi, I'm uh, Michael Brennan Doherty from The Week and an alumnus of the American Conservative. And um, Michael, you mentioned you know, Congress's opposition being kind of key in, in preventing a smaller than small uh, intervention in Syria. Um, how, does anyone have any clue or idea how um, the foreign policy preferences of the electorate could be expressed in an election involving the executive branch, which actually has this. I mean, in 2008, it was just two years after a th- the thumping for Republicans over Iraq, and yet they nominated John McCain. Um, in, 2012, I, in 2012, there was a candidate there, uh, kind of announcing a foreign policy that was about jobs and other things. You know, John Huntsman would go out there. I'm sorry to be a cliche of myself talking about John Huntsman, but he said that there was a, you know, our future was in the trade routes of Asia, not in Libya. But, I mean, he got zero response. I mean, it was a, it was a flat line as far as electoral politics was concerned. I mean, he might as well have not been saying anything. And for, and for him, he's not a, an outsider like Rand Paul or Ron Paul kind of waving a pitchfork for, like, a Jeffersonian republic. I mean, this was a, an insider, an ambassador to China. This was someone deep in the foreign policy establishment. But there was no traction on that. So is there any political valence, or is, or is the executive branch kind of in its nature um, the, the interventionist branch of government, you know, and sort of has antibodies for this? Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, that's a great question, and, and I think the way I'd answer that a little bit is, um, you know, if you look at what's happened in the presidential politics, the last six elections, Democrats have won a majority of the vote in five of those elections. The only won four of them, um, but of course they won a majority in five of them. The one... They didn't win, but it was 2004 in which foreign policy played a, a major role. And I think one of the things that sort of, I think, is not appreciated enough is that the end of the Cold War was a, a big political boon for Democrats. And that during the Cold War, Republicans always had this built-in advantage of being seen as the more hawkish party, the party better able to stand up to the, to, to the communists. And after, after the, the fall of the Berlin Wall and after the, the fall of the Soviet Union, that argument faded. And so Republicans tried for a long time to come up with a new... Uh, boogeyman, and they and they they un- tragically found one, unfortunately, in, in after 9/11, and that became sort of the, their their way to sort of gain some political advantage from foreign policy. But in general, I just think that that foreign policy doesn't play a huge role in presidential elections unless you're sort of in the midst of a of a conflict. Um, and 
I mean, who knows what will happen in the next two and a half years. I really hope that we're not in the war in 1916. Right. I don't think we're going to be. Yeah. So I don't think it's going to play a huge factor. Where I think it could make a difference, and where you've seen it make a difference, is on the, is in the, in, in, between the, in the two parties, within the parties. Right? So in 2008, there's no question that Barack Obama won the Democratic nomination, you know, in large part because of his opposition to the Iraq War and Hillary Clinton's support for the Iraq War. There's no question about that. Uh, that's what gave him a political uh, um, opening. Really opening, right, right, right. right. And it was, a, it was a vulnerability that, that Hillary never dealt with properly. Um, what I think is interesting to think about is whether or not in 2016, whether this plays out, how this plays out in the Republican Party. Right? I, I, I'm, I'm loath to sort of suggest that, that Republicans are going to go for somebody who is, uh, who's a bit of a neo-isolationist like Rand Paul, because it just goes against how Republicans really think on foreign policy. But, you know, when you have people like John McCain, who were dominating the foreign policy discourse, you know, saying things like, we won in Iraq, and that driving a lot of where Republicans are on foreign policy right now, I do wonder whether it creates a backlash within the party and, and allows someone like Paul to gain a political advantage. Who knows? I don't think it matters much between the parties. I think ultimately the next election will be about the economy, as most elections, presidential elections are. But I think within the parties, yeah, it could, have, it could certainly have a, have a play a role. I just add one thing to what Michael just said, and I think it is widely believed that, I mean, first of all, foreign policy doesn't usually factor in elections. Uh, there are a few rare exceptions, 2006 certainly being one, 2008 because of what had happened to Barack Obama. I think you're wrong, Michael, in 2004. I think, I think in 2004 that the Iraq War was a drag on George W. Bush, but it wasn't large enough to, over, to compensate. If you look, he underperformed where he should have been given the state of the economy in 2004. And the other reason why it didn't matter as much is because he was running against a guy who voted for the Iraq War. There was not a clear distinction sure. between the two major candidates. And, and even in some respects, Kerry sort of, you know, the whole I was for it before I was against it sort of thing, which, which the Republicans seized upon with, with gusto. So if there is a real choice, uh, uh, within either of the two parties, or mainly, I presume, within the Republican Party, or a major, or a, a clear choice in foreign policy between the, the leading Democrat and the leading Republican, then foreign policy might be uh, a bigger factor than you would otherwise expect. Yes. Could, could I ask you to go to the use microphone? The, the mic, Norm. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, but this, this audience on TV is going to want to hear your every nuance. <laughs> yeah, I'm Norman Byrne. I'm Norman Birnbaum from uh, The Nation. Um, before the Syrian uh, decision by the president, something happened in a small, archaic country across the um, Atlantic which we mostly know from Masterpiece Theatre. Uh, the British Parliament acted out a scene from Masterpiece Theatre <laughs> and uh, convinced and took a majority vote after a, a quite an yes. um, interesting uh, debate um, not to intervene in Syria. Now, to, I don't know, <clears throat> no very large proportion, no very large proportion of the American public looks at C-SPAN but somehow the news must have gotten to people, and it must certainly have come um, to the president's desk in his morning intelligence briefing and had some influence on his decision. Uh, uh, but it was, it was quite a remarkable sequence of events because it did seem to turn Obama around. Quite, obviously, it meant that he couldn't count on much uh, European support in that. The, um, uh, Germans certainly weren't going to go in if the British and British didn't. Uh, and um, Monsieur Hollande uh, is not convincing as a successor to, to Napoleon. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> what did happen? Hmm? Gents? John? What, what did happen? I, I mean, I agreed with the point in the first place. I think the British not going along was the mo single most important thing. And I think that without that, uh, he, he, the French were ready to, the planes were on the runway, I think that uh, they would have done something. I think that was, the, then there was, then he decided that he would uh, submit the whole thing to the public and it blew up in his face. So that's the, so, so I agree with you, Norman. Yes. Yeah, I, I think I agree with well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Norm. 
Um, let me pose this thought, because we're talking about um, our, our sense of political reality and a sense of political sentiment as it exists in the country, but we're also living through some very dramatic events in the Middle East right now. The president has suggested, he's being kind of uh, wary in terms of timing, but he's suggested that he's going to take some action um, regarding the um, uh, emergence of um, ISIS uh, in Iraq and uh, what that bodes for Iraq and Syria. To what extent do you see any change as a result of these developments, either in terms of the elites and how they feel about what needs to be done and in terms of uh, popular sentiment in the country? Well, I would say quickly, Bob, that the elites haven't changed. The elites were in favor of intervention before. They're in favor of intervention now, generally speaking. Uh, and the public remains overwhelmingly opposed. Still, I mean, the, and the little polling there has been done, uh, you know, confirms that. Um, now, that's not to say that there might be kind of opportunities or, or circumstances in the Iraq case where the precise use of force might actually be useful for degrading ISIS's capability or, or blunting their 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 progress, and I think that was part. Of, that was also part of the problem with the Syrian case is there wasn't a clear military solution. What exactly were these pinpricks, pin, pinpricks strikes supposed to do? So I think that it is possible that they could make a case for military action, but of a particular character and very, very small in a good sort of way. Right? I've come up with a different term besides unbelievably small. Targeted. Yeah, you know, one of the things about this that's sort of interesting is that there is a, actually a reasonable argument to be made for use of force in Iraq. I mean, I, I'm not going to make it, but I think there's a reasonable <laughs> argument for it. I think there was a reasonable argument to be made for force against Syria. I, I, actually, I did make it at the time, although I, I'm not so sure I still agree with it. Um, the problem is that, that when you're in this kind of political environment, both the bad cases for war and the good cases for war are not, are not going to have any popular support. I mean, the Syria thing is fascinating, right? I mean, you saw such opposition to what was basically it, you know, uh, some cruise missiles and, and airstrikes. No one talked about use of American troops on the ground. Nobody. And I think, and, and even nonetheless, the, the fear of this spiraling into some bigger conflict clearly inflamed a lot of Americans. Um, and I think on Iraq, you know, this is, again, I, I go back to my other ar earlier argument. The internationalists who want the U.S. to be active around the world, they are stabbing themselves in the foot by doing, by, or shooting themselves in the foot. Shooting themselves. Stabbing themselves in the, foot. Themselves in the back. They're shooting, shooting themselves. and stabbing themselves in the foot. That's how bad their <laughs> argument is. And they're taking a crowbar and hitting themselves too. I mean, they are, the, the good cases, the reasonable cases for use of force are not going to be heard by Americans who simply do not want to get involved in another stupid war. And if you're, every single time that something bad happens around the world, like Crimea, your response is, we have to use force. It's like the, the little boy who cried wolf. At some point, people are just going to tune you out. And I think, you know, we talked about this with the elites. I mean, I, as somebody who's not an elite, I guess, maybe I am, I don't know. Maybe I, maybe I, maybe I, am, I don't realize yeah, I just it. just don't know it. Yeah, right. But it's not a foreign policy elite. I, I'm, just, I'm just sort of stupefied by the disconnect between the way elites talk about foreign policy and American leadership and the realities of how Americans feel about these issues. This has always been the case. But I don't think I've ever seen anything like it, what, I'm, what you're seeing right now, the, the level of disconnect and, and the, the, the confident pronouncements of the Robert Kagan's and John McCain's of the world about this. I mean, John McCain doesn't even count. Robert Kagan's is, is a better example. And, and, the, and the reality of where Americans see this. Uh, and I think you know, the elites sort of need to catch up to American people on this issue. I see we have a question. Yes. Uh, my name is Abraham Kuravilla. I'm an editor with an Indian magazine called Anvesana. Um, I had a question on the impact of the alternative media. Uh, because I closely follow the debate regarding Syria, and uh, you know, in my opinion, the the, West, the, the mainstream Western coverage w was superficial. So to understand the situation, I turned to Russian and Syrian sources. And what I was so surprised by was to see ordinary Americans who had no ethnic ties to Syria or religious ties, they were posting links from RT.com, Russia Today, or Syrian Perspective. And as far as I know, this is something fairly new. And so I was wondering if you could talk about that. Go ahead, John. I, I don't have anything very interesting. I, I'll just tell you, I, on uh, Syria, I uh, like uh, Joshua Landis' uh, website. He's a uh, professor from the University of Oklahoma. There are, there are available sources if you don't want to have to rely on the Russians uh, to find out what's going on in, uh, in Syria. Um, that's the 
I mean, nah. Right. I, I think it's. Yeah. A, I think it's a fair point. I mean, it's, yeah. But it's not, and it's not an entirely new phenomenon. Maybe it was just that Syria was the first time that it was a, actually able to manifest, where the the phenomenon of the the mainstream media, so called, losing its its stranglehold on information. Again, that's a long term. That that's been a long term process. But it may be that the Syria case was one of the first times that it actually, uh, you know, resulted in something that you can that you can grab a hold of. And, and just say, I mean, I you know, watching some of the Iraq coverage and some of the people that are being tried out to offer analysis on this. I mean, I saw. Yesterday, Paul Bremer was on. Uh, he had a he had an it's, in the Wall Street Journal. Well, that's more expected, but he's on, he's on television. I mean, that's like interviewing the captain of the Hindenburg about flying a dirt, <laughs> like a Zeppelin. I mean, it was just an, I can't even imagine how anybody could think he'd have a, an important insight. But these are the people who end up being sort of, you know, leaned on when, in these situations. So I can understand why sometimes people want to find alternative sources. <laughs> well, we are at the end of our time tether. So uh, uh, thank you, Michael, Chris, John. Uh, thank you, American Conservative. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're finished. Yeah, she is. Okay. Okay, hi, I'm Maisie Allison. I'm an editor at the American Conservative. Thank you all for coming today. I'll keep this brief. There are just a few people I'd like to thank for making today possible. First, we are grateful to Catherine Sylvie and Professor Glazer at the Institute for Security and Conflict Studies, Sam Goldman, and the GW event staff. We were thrilled to do this in the Morton Auditorium. Thank you to Dan Dresner, my new best friend, who came in on the red eye for the first panel this morning after a book event in Seattle. Also to Amanda Lapino Esposito, who as you can see is an expert planner. And thank you to the Foundation for Middle East Peace and the American Prospect. I know many of you were here to see Daniel Larison in real life. <laughs> He's a force and one of the main reasons I became interested in the American conservative in the first place. It's very fun to work for a conservative website that publishes headlines like, thank goodness Romney isn't president. <laughs> for those of us at the American Conservative, the new internationalism is part of a recurring theme and challenge. How to promote prudence and restraint, but also creativity, fresh thinking, and even flexibility in adapting to new and difficult realities when the overriding tendency is ideology-fueled alarmism and overreach. Obviously, this tendency is most dangerous in foreign policy. All of which is why this moment, where the American mainstream and many of the thinkers gathered here today have forced such a serious rethinking of America's role in the world, has taken on such critical importance. So thank you for being a part of this small, but what could what could turn out to be significant step in building on the new foreign policy consensus. It was a privilege to have you all in one room. Finally, we're excited to partner with Blogging Heads, where some of the speakers from today, as well as others who couldn't be here, will continue discussions. So stay tuned. And please take a magazine and a copy of an article by William Lind, who spoke earlier today, on the Strategic Defense Initiative. Thanks so much.